thank you everyone for being here. My name is Carly Jackson and my capstone is an assessment of the physical accessibility of cedar for cultural use to members of the Haida Nation on Haida Gwaii, British Columbia. So just a brief introduction to Haida Gwaii for those of you that aren't familiar with the area. It's an island archipelago off the northwest coast of British Columbia. Uh, here you can see it in, the rela in relation to the rest of Canada. So it's the unceded territory of the Haida Nation, and it was once called the Queen Charlotte Islands, as some of you might know it. Um, but the name was changed to Haida Gwaii in 2010 as part of a wider reconciliation agreement between the Council of the Haida Nation and the government of BC. So these are cedar stewardship areas. They're unique to Haida Gwaii. And this is just a map of all the cedar stewardship areas um, on the island. So cedar stewardship areas or CSAs are a protected area classification unique to Haida Gwaii. And they were created with the intention to preserve cedar for present and future Haida Gwaii generations. So CSAs were formed in response to concerns of the overlogging of cedar trees and old growth that started in the 1920s. So many logging companies exist and operate simultaneously on the islands that now have to be mindful and operate around the CSAs. And a management plan was uh, finished and published for the areas in 2016. So during my internship this summer on Haida Gwaii, the Terrestrial Stewardship Director of the Council of the Haida Nation mentioned that they'd been wanting to revisit the CSAs, but had not had the time or personnel to do so. So my goal was to conduct an updated inventory of the CSAs, albeit a general one given the time frame, uh, in the hopes of helping the Council of the Haida Nation. So, why are CSAs important? Well, cedar is a cultural keystone species to Haida. Um, on the islands, there are there is western red cedar, also known as Tsu in the Haida language, and yellow cedar, which is Scotland in the Haida language. Um, red cedar is known as the tree of life, and it's literally used from cradle to grave in all aspects of Haida life. So these are just a few images of some of the ways that um, cedar is used culturally in Haida Gwaii. Uh, I know most of you can't see, but I've even got my little Haida lady earrings on with their cedar hats <laughs> beaded in uh, honor of my presentation today. So cedar, particularly old growth, not only is culturally important, but it's also very ecologically important on the islands. So the management plan was introduced um, and it introduced legislative access to CSAs, but if physical access is impeded, are they really being used effectively? So it's important to ensure that all members of the Haida Nation that wish to access the CSAs are capable of doing so. And that's where my research comes in. So my research questions were threefold. How does species dominance influence accessibility? How do road conditions influence accessibility? And how does terrain influence accessibility? So how did I do that? Well, let's start with methods. Ideally, I would have conducted ground inventory of the CSAs. However, I found my way to this topic too late in, into my internship to do so, and it would take a really long time to do that. So instead, I pulled um, data from three databases in the BC data catalog, and then input them into ArcGIS and clipped them to CSA boundaries. So the first database I used was the Vegetation Resource Inventory Database, or VRI, which I used to pull out data on red and yellow cedar. And then for the roads, I used the Digital Road Atlas Database and the Forest Tenure Road Section Lines Database. I then consulted with the local um, district resource officer who highlighted the roads that are currently in use on Haida Gwaii now. Um, I then applied a one kilometer buffer to the roads to um, imitate foot access into the CSAs. Finally, I applied a digital elevation model from NASA clipped to the Haida Gwaii region to determine the slope and elevation of the areas for terrain. So I also devised an accessibility rating system based on personal experience and visual imagery produced in the results. So here you can see it is put into three categories, poorly accessible, fairly accessible, and good accessibility. 
And then these are the factors analyzed in the study and they're split into each category based on the results. So what came of this? Well, first we looked at species dominance. And um, as you can see here, what we're most uh, focused on are the red areas, which is Western red cedar or CW, and the yellow areas, which are which is yellow cedar. Um, so this chart represents the number of forest stands in each CSA categorized by the most dominant species of a given stand. So you can see that Naden, Masset, Ein, and East Coast Graham all have red cedar dominant stands that make up more than half of the total stands in the CSA. This is really good. That means there's more cedar available for access. It's also interesting that Ein has the highest proportion of yellow cedar, although it's still only 4% of the total stands. Uh, this could be attributed to the fact there is less yellow cedar on the islands than there are red cedar. And they're also um, usually uh, found in high elevation areas and Ein happens to have some of those. So I just wanted to show this for you to get a spatial idea. I actually have many maps, but I'm only showing one of three of the CSA areas for timing's sake. Uh, so this is Naden, Ein, and Masset. And you can see here that the cedar dominant stands are in yellow, and then the cedar stewardship areas, the total areas that are not dominant are in blue or what's blue on my screen, it's a bit of a gray color to you. Um, so that just shows the breakup of that chart. So then how accessible are the CSAs? Well, for the purposes of this presentation, I've decided to include road access and ter terrain results into the overall accessibility results, since it's easier to see their effects when all put together. So here I have this table, which is the overall accessibility rating of CSAs when all factors included in this study have been analyzed. So that includes the red cedar and yellow cedar dominant stands, the number of roads that intersect the CSAs, the slope as classified as gentle, moderate, or steep, and then the overall accessibility uh, rating based on that accessibility rating system I mentioned. So the rating system helps to show where to go first, but this could be a double-edged sword because you don't wanna to go to one area too often and over harvest this. So it's also important to note that some of the fares in this um, were very close to being classified as poor, but due to rounding, they were not. So that's just something to keep in mind. And when we look at the average accessibility rating of all the CSAs on Haida Gwaii, that comes out to fair. However, Spatial analysis is not so clear cut, forestry pun intended. <laughs> so here I have this spatially, which tells a different story. So you can see here the terrain classified as moderate or steep since gentle is relatively easy access. And then you have all the roads with that one kilometer buffer and then the cedar stewardship area boundaries with those cedar dominant stands in yellow. So I want to make, point your attention to Ein here. In the table, it was classified as fairly accessible. However, when you look, this whole section of Ein is not accessible based on the criteria of the study. And this has a very high portion of those cedar dominant stands. Similarly, Jaskatla here, the entire northern portion of that is also not accessible based on the criteria. Um, and that was considered fair as well. So given more time, a study such as this could be more spatial. For example, each stand could be mapped and that could help further research in the future. So a brief summary of my findings. Well, how does species presence influence accessibility? Well, it decreases the area of available cultural wood. Um, and these are priority areas because that's where the cultural access is going to happen. And in some places, this is more obvious than others, particularly it's noticeable in Skidigat Inlet. Um, and then second, how do road conditions influence accessibility? Well, they restrict entry points into only certain areas of the CSAs, like we just saw with Ein and Juscatla. And finally, how does terrain influence accessibility? Well, it impedes the walkability of an area. So it's really difficult to imagine this last one just by looking at maps, but personal experience really tells otherwise. I was fortunate enough to visit some of these CSAs during my time there. 
And when I was traveling in them, I often was on my hands and knees fighting through vegetation with um, branches pulling at my skin and hair. Um, and it often took me a long time just to travel 100 or 200 meters. Now, granted, I acknowledge that I am from Toronto, so I am not either born and raised, um, and they might be more used to that terrain, but I am still 26 and in relatively good condition and shape. <laughs> so it's important to factor that in for all those people that might not be. So how can we move forward? How can we further and improve physical accessibility to these areas? Well, first and foremost, we can build on the 2016 management plan as it's meant to be a long-term plan. So we can do this by revisiting the areas um, and the plan every five or so years to make any necessary adjustments. The environment isn't static, it's always changing, so it's important that our plans reflect that. So the CHN could hire someone specifically tasked with this or delegate it to an already existing employee or even contract the work out to someone on island. In addition to planning, um, some surveying of community members could be done and they could be surveyed about where they strip, what areas, roughly how much and how they get there. And that could really help inform future planning and also help inform um, roads that should be managed permanently, which might be the most, <clears throat> excuse me, obvious short-term solution. So roads are maintained by the licensees that own them on the island, and they're paid for out of pocket with no reimbursements if there's no hauling taking place on them. So it's unlikely that logging companies um, will want to pay to maintain roads um, if they're for CSA access only. So some sort of central funding system contributed to by the CHN, the, B, uh, the BC government, and possibly the federal government could be established to maintain these roads. So moving forward and looking to the future possible research projects, um, some socio-cultural projects such as ethnographic research could be very helpful. So this poster is an example of a documentary titled A Cedar is Life, and it highlights the importance of cedar to all Pacific Northwest Coast First Nations. So something similar to this, but in the Haida Gwaii specific context could be very helpful. For example, videographers could interview elders on the values of CSAs to get a sense of the community's thoughts on current CSA structures structures and why or why not more resources should be put into these areas or similar areas. So moving from that, research, uh, scientific research partnerships could be formed and these could provide an extra layer of protection and funding to the areas as dual purpose areas. So this is an example of a paper that was published in 2021 on yellow cedar decline due to climate change on Haida Gwaii. So this is a perfect example of research that could take place using trees in CSAs to extrapolate data and then be put towards um, a good research cause. So it's very important that throughout any of these suggestions, particularly scientific research, um, the researchers would have to ensure the community's permission and that the research really benefits and includes the Haida people in every step of the way. And that, um, goes to here, I'd like to make a few acknowledgements uh, without whom this project would not have come to fruition. All the staff at University of Toronto, particularly my supervisors, Daniela and Anne, who really helped me through the writing process and data analysis. And then the CHN Council of the Haida Nation, my external examiner, Jeremy Calhoun, uh, for helping me and being a friend on the islands. And then Marlene Little, who also brought this idea to my attention and without whom this whole project would not have come to fruition. Uh, the people at the Ministry of Forest with whom I did my internship, particularly Risha Rushton and Larry Duke for helping with roads. And then finally, I would be greatly remiss if I did not thank my MFC 2022 cohort, uh, as these were some of the best times of my life, also some of the most stressful times of my life, but that created a bond that I'm very thankful for and will never forget. So with that, I say thank you and hawa and any questions for me? <laughs> Thank you.
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Carly. Um, first, I will ask Jeremy, who I think is on the line, um, to ask a question. Jeremy? Hi there. Hi. Great to digitally meet you all. It wasn't too long that uh, I myself was uh, one of the uh, semester, uh, not semester students, but one of the uh, program students. So that was an excellent presentation, Carly. A uh, good indication for me where to send off staff to go start doing uh, sampling plots for uh, species makeup. Um, I know that, uh, like, did you find any limitations when using VRI as some of that data is, is pretty out of date and, and fairly uh, fairly uniform sort of in its its structure? Yes, big time. Um, so... <laughs> I'll go, this was originally in my slides, but of course time. Um, so I had to make a lot of assumptions um, because I was only able to use um, databases that were, I had no say of what went into them. Um, so one of the biggest ones with the vegetation resource inventory, the VRI, um, I had to assume that the, all the stands uh, or the polygons are uniform in size, but they are not. Um, and so that would really probably lead towards some different results. Um, but for the purposes of this, I just didn't have the time to do so. Um, additionally, yeah, you're kind of stuck with certain, um, data. I know a lot of it was updated in 2021, some in 2022, but then some had also not been updated since like 2009 and 2007. So that posed some limitations, um, Luckily, most of it was 2021, but yeah, to answer your question, there was definitely some limitations with that, um, particularly, you know, the stand aspect. Yes. I think my other uh, point slash question, so historically, it's kind of funny. I was just in a meeting before this. We were just talking about this, but uh, so 10% of each of the cedar stewardship areas can be harvested. It's never happened in the history of CSAs just because the social license um, of the licensee to be able to put that for it and it be approved at the solutions table, which is the intergovernmental uh, body that sort of reviews cutting permit, road permit applications, uh, so that, that's been really seen as a, as a non-starter. Um, so the kind of corollary to that is that there's an expectation that our staff are going to go out and actually sort of field verify whether or not uh, a lot of these polygons, uh, you know, or or rather the cedar stewardship areas are as uh, cedar dominant. So again, that's super helpful with pointing to Ayn and Yakun um, as, uh, you know, predominant areas for that. Um, I guess when your slide speaking to to next steps, um, so there's revisiting the management plan and part of part of what we're doing is working on an island wide sort of forest strategy. That's kind of specifically what my what my job is. Um, as, as some of you may know, um, the the Hydar are very close to going to court for title. They're sort of in the evidence providing evidence phase at the moment and, and so on. So the implications implications of, of title are, are pretty significant and what that means from how force policy is practiced on Haida Gwaii. So um, knowing that licensees don't like to pay for things that they're not going to use um, and recognizing that um, some of this, some of this data, like you said, is, is a couple of years old. What would you specifically recommend in terms of uh, how to sort of facilitate and support um, cedar st stewardship areas in the future? Um, okay, well, so um, I mentioned very briefly, um, I think it would be pretty valuable, especially with this whole entire rework and the likely inventorying and data collection that will accompany it, especially if you're on the evidence portion. I do think that a role... Um, within the terrestrial stewardship or the national natural resources team um, dedicated specifically to um, CSAs uh, and or broader cedar inventory perhaps across the island could really um, be beneficial because then you have someone's time 
Um, and the resource like all focused on that one job and that could really um, push that forward um, in terms of getting things done and adding to the plan. So that could be like a, a separate hire um, or I mentioned it could be delegated to an already existing employee. Although from my time there, I know that everyone on the CHN is already quite busy in their current roles, um, hence me doing this project. Um, so yeah, that's that's my suggestion. Um, and then just a lot of collaboration between that one role and um, other members. So uh, a, spe a specific hire for the role of sampling then? Yes. Awesome. Thanks very much. Okay. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, we have another question, uh, Trina. a lot about um in in terms of your recommendations moving forward funding so how is the plan funded right now the management plan yeah um i believe that's the council of the Haida nation so the Haida nation itself is funding I believe so, yeah. so your recommendations are to ensure more money right and so i mean i'm wondering in terms of what are the other bodies that could be access to fund so um when I talk about like a central funding system, I talk about it more for roads, but it could be for any any portion of this. Um, I'm considering um, that like a com a combination almost of CHN funds and um, particularly the province of BC, which would probably likely be the Ministry of Forests um, branch of the BC government um, for this. And then, um, yeah, you could write like a proposal um, to to lobby for those right. those funds, and maybe even the federal government. That's just depending on how um, how that would go. Right. And so then, then further, so your your recommendations are scientific research partnerships, right? And then right. ensuring that the medical community is engaged very effectively. Is there already like a policy framework that has a lot of um? Yeah. So. In general, at least from my time there, um, I noticed that there is um, a lot of collaborative work going on. Um, and often uh, members of the Council of the Haida Nation or people that work for the Council of the Haida Nation are involved in uh, research projects. For example, I was involved in one with the Mother Tree Network when I was there and they're from UBC. And so they, all, they bring in, um, people that work for the Council of the Haida Nation to ensure that there's um, consultation going on between and involvement in it. So they are pretty, pretty, for lack of a better word, pretty great already with that. Um, I just think it is important, for example, there is a bit of a lack, um, like I myself was slightly concerned with going over there because I didn't want to just go uh, do some research and like hightail it out of there and then talk about something that's not mine. Um, so that's why I've really tried to stay in touch with um, people from the Council of the Haida Nation. Um, particularly, I will send all my work over. And additionally, um, one of that, the problems um, that a woman named Marlene Little a Haida matriarch um, and expert weaver um, mentioned was there'd been a lot of people going to Haida Gwaii in the past, but they hadn't seen any of the capstones or reports uh, or research um, made from their visits. So over the summer, Sally was very kind and um, the librarian was also very kind and she scanned all of the Haida reports, the reports on Haida Gwaii and sent them to me. And then I sent them in a file to Marlene to try and bridge that gap. Um, so there is room for improvement, but in terms of on the ground research, you there is generally uh, consultation um, involved because otherwise they wouldn't be able to. Thank you, Carly. There are always uh, many, many dimensions of, of when, when we're looking at the social side of uh, of the kind of research we do. So thank you very much. Thanks, Anne. Thank you. And now a question from Daniela. Good work, Carly. I had a question about, um, um, do you think that this project, and, and you already gave suggestion, what else could be done, would benefit if let's say the areas uh, where stripping is going, if they are mapped, 
um, if you know where those areas are, that would give you an idea, like, you know, how long does it take where people go, that this project could be improved with something like that? Yes, definitely. Um, I do think it would really benefit, um, again, more time, but the nature of the capstone. Um, because if you map everything out spatially, you could see and make plans um, more specifically on where stripping could occur, maybe in a cyclical fashion, so that, again, um, you don't go to the areas deemed good accessibility and overstrip and over harvest. Um, the Haida uh, historically and currently are, have been pretty pretty good with this. Um, they often say that the um, cedar trees in an area, if you strip too much or kill a cedar tree, they'll remember you. Uh, the cedar trees will remember you. So they usually are sure just to take one strip from a tree and allow it to continue to grow. Um, so I think it would benefit from mapping each stand spatially because you would just get a more detailed information um, on each stand and that could help inform more specific um, management recommendations instead of the general ones. And thank you. I've learned so much about this, which I didn't know. And one thing that I forgot to ask you um, was um, what time of year do they do it? Uh, uh, so it's when the sap is okay. is 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 flowing um so, so it's often different um because you know Haida Gwaii is pretty northern BC so it's at different times um but when the sap starts flowing I know that while I was there I had to have a meeting with Marlene um and then she was going off for about a month because she was going harvest cedar harvesting and that was um end of July beginning of August if, if I'm remembering correctly Thank you. Um, and I think we um, are out of time for questions, but fascinating presentation. Thank you so much.